You know, arguably, climate change is the biggest challenge that the humanity is facing, although there are lots of people who deny that it does even exist. Most people agree that this is uh, happening, and this is happening mainly as a result of human activities, and we need to do something about it. So a lot of people are wondering whether we need to actually change the economic system uh, in order to address this issue. These are quotes from Naomi Klein, the Canadian activist and author. The capitalist system or the free market system is at the root of uh, the environmental problem. The response uh, from the economics uh, profession, dominated by neoclassical economists, is that actually the solution to environmental problem is more markets not less markets. Actually, these economies have urged us to use markets more widely in terms of both setting the goals of uh, environmental policy and creating the means of uh, managing the environment. Reducing pollution actually means that you are also going to forego the benefits of those activities that have generated pollution. Now, this is a very th th reasonable point. Therefore, these, uh, these economists uh, say the optimal level of pollution is not zero. Yeah? Because it means that uh, you are also going to completely go forego the benefits of producing something, driving around. So they say that uh, you have to compare the cost of the damage that pollution creates and the benefits from the pollution generating activities and compare them. Yeah? The neoclassical approach uh, tries to express all benefits and costs in monetary terms. Yeah? So how much is it uh, going to benefit people to produce these things? Yeah? How much damage does it do in terms of uh, the, the, uh, ruining people's health and so on? But they try to monetize all this so that they can compare them on a sort of objective basis. When trying to put monetary values and various costs and benefits involved in a certain policy, neoclassical economists prefer to use market price, uh, prices if there's a market. You know? So forest of trees, used for Christmas trees, it's relatively simple to calculate. You know? Of course, when it comes to environmental policy, typically the values of environmental assets are very complex. That forest would also provide other benefits. Huh? Sanctuary for an endangered species of birds, or it might give people a place for pleasant walks and sports activities. This is among the specialists known as the amenity value of the forest. Yeah? There is no, I mean, the market for endangered uh, species of birds, and you know it becomes quite complicated. So suppose that uh, the government is uh, contemplating the introduction of this uh, environmental regulation about uh, drinking water that will reduce the level of, uh, say, arsenic in water, and yeah, it's uh, going to save uh, one life in one million per year. Now suppose that this country has uh, 100 million people. That's the population of Mexico, Ethiopia. Yeah, so, so this means that if you introduce this uh, regulation, you are basically going to save 100 people. There'll be some cost uh, to doing this, so you need to compare that cost uh, to the benefit, but the how do you value human life? Huh? You know, a lot of people at that point give up. You know, I mean, uh, you cannot value human life. But you know, many of uh, my professional colleagues are undaunted by that, so they try to calculate somehow how markets value human life. Yeah? So one popular measure is to look at uh, wage differentials. What I mean is, you know, suppose that there are two jobs, but one job involves some risk. Yeah? and another is uh, risk-free. Yeah. Now, the risky job would require you know, paying higher wages to people because 
you know, people are not stupid. They know that there's a slight risk of uh, being killed in the job. So suppose that that probability is uh, 1 in 10,000. So what uh, economists do is uh, to look at that and then say, what is the actual wage differential? If it's, uh, say, $900 per year, you will say, well, people are willing to get paid $900 more for a 1 out of 10,000 chance of being killed. Yeah? Multiply the 900 by 10,000, you will get $9 million. So by using wage differentials that, uh, in the labor market, economists have cleverly calculated how people actually value their lives. Yeah? I mean, no one said that. I'm thinking uh, human life uh, is uh, the, the $10 million or $100 million. But by using a market prices, they have uh, cleverly worked out how you can infer the kind of value that the people put on, well, their own lives. Yeah? Now, this is a fictitious example, but it's uh, not completely fictitious in the sense that 9 million is indeed the value of uh, what uh, they call statistical life used by U.S. government agencies. Yeah? So when the U.S. government agency decides on, say, introducing uh, tougher regulation on drinking water or relaxing regulation on the, the road safety, they basically say one person is worth $9 million. Well, once again, I mean, we have uh, a serious eth ethical problem here because a lot of people will just uh, refuse to value human life in monetary terms, yeah, period. But even when you accept that this is uh, that, uh, morally acceptable, there are lots of practical problems. Yeah? Because A, this uh, suggests that when the people choose these jobs, uh, they do it with uh, full information. No, I mean, uh, usually they don't, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, people will vaguely know that uh, there's a chance of getting killed, you know, one in, uh, say, 10,000 chance, but do they really know it's uh, one in 10,000 or the one in 9,000, one in 6,000? They really don't know. Yeah? Also, this uh, practice assumes that wage is the only factor determining which job to take. Mm -hmm. Some work can be boring to the point of uh, soul being soul-destroying. Yeah? So the, the, there are these other dimensions of work I mean, the, the, that the people uh, consider when they choose jobs. So even though these uh, the neoclassical environmental economists go out, of, uh, go out on a limb to put monetary value even for you know, uh, human beings, even they admit that there are things where you simply cannot use uh, market prices to infer the value for. Yeah? Environmental economists will uh, recognize that environmental assets uh, like forests provide ecosystem services like you know, stabilizing the soil, retaining water. So typically that, that when you have a forest, when it rains, uh, the water gets uh, absorbed by the trees and the forest uh, the, as a whole, and then more slowly get uh, the release. So the risk of flooding is reduced. If you have uh, just a deforested area, the water just uh, pours down and then uh, creates, uh, creates uh, flooding. And most uh, relevantly for climate change, uh, the trees absorb carbon dioxide. So you know, the, there are these uh, ecosystem services some uh, natural assets uh, might have even cultural or symbolic values. Yeah? Some forests might be considered a place of uh, the special significance uh, for some group of indigenous people. Yeah? Now, how do you value these things? Yeah? Economists are the, the people who don't easily give up. So what do they do? They do surveys. Yeah? You can't just... Uh, go to someone and uh, say, well, the, the, that forest uh, in your uh, area, how much would you value it for? You know, no one has an idea of that. Yeah? I mean, especially if it, uh, the question becomes uh, something like, you know, how much uh, do you think is uh, the value of uh, protecting this uh, endangered uh, species of bird that live in that forest? Yeah? 
So that they that have uh, devised that, that rather clever uh, questions like, if uh, there's this uh, charity protecting this uh, endangered uh, species of bird, how much would you, would you donate uh, the, uh, per year to this charity? Is it zero? Is it uh, $20? Is it uh, $40? So they uh, have uh, developed ways of uh, kind of teasing out the, the, the people's real kind of uh, monetary estimation the, the, through these surveys. Unfortunately, these uh, the surveys can be very unreliable because uh, these are totally hypothetical questions. You know, those uh, kind of charities may not even exist. You know? I mean, you might be asking people who have a very different philosophy about their relationship with nature. You know? And researchers have also found that uh, very often uh, when asked these uh, hypothetical questions, people often interpret it in their own way and reframe the question as uh, something like, how much uh, money do you actually donate uh, to charities protecting wildlife? Yeah? But uh, this is a very different question from that very specific yeah? but, uh, question about uh, that particular endangered uh, species of bird. So, there are lots of problems with the, these uh, surveys. But to go even deeper into the limitations of uh, cost-benefit analysis, we can actually look at this uh, very particular monetary value that you often hear in the debate on climate change. Now, there's this apparent consensus that if we follow this path of business as usual, as it is called, basically do nothing uh, to uh, kind of control uh, climate change, the world average temperature will rise by four degrees, and that would bring cost that is equivalent to around 5% of global GDP per year. This is a pretty widely accepted estimate. But when you actually pick this uh, number apart and try to see how this has been constructed, you will begin to see that a huge amount of assumptions and simplifications and omissions have gone into it. The number is very problematic. I mean, this is not to say that we should never come up with these kind of numbers. Eh? But when you are interpreting these numbers, you really have to understand how these were made. Yeah? And I sometimes joke that numbers are like sausages. Eh? You don't know what went into them. You don't want to know what went into them. Yeah? Numbers that are basically manufactured. Yeah? I mean, even relatively kind of simple things like rate of unemployment. I mean, these are the highly manufactured numbers. Yeah? Which is not to say that they are wrong or fictitious or uh, misleading necessarily. Yeah? But you really need to know how, how these uh, numbers have been created in order to uh, uh, in order to judge whether that number is you know, useful, at least for the purpose that you are trying to use it for. There are a series of problems illustrated by this 5% uh, of GDP number, and I've listed uh, six of them. The first is uh, the issue of complexity. In estimating this 5% uh, of GDP number, a lot of things have been excluded. So people have pointed out that this estimate did not include the possibility of temperature rising above a certain threshold and starting the thawing of the Arctic permafrost, that area of frozen ground in the Arctic area. And some people argue that this will release a massive amount of methane gas which is four times more powerful than carbon dioxide in terms of uh, its impact on global warming, and they didn't include this. Yeah? Others have uh, pointed out it, uh, this uh, estimate didn't uh, take into account the fact that uh, the rising sea level due to global warming will destroy a lot of island nations and coastal communities, and how are you going to value that? Yeah? 
No, I mean, this rising sea level is a serious uh, the, the challenge for some of these uh, island states. I mean, I think one of the Pacific island states basically have decided to buy up land in Australia and move the country if uh, the worst comes to the worst. You know? you know, they'll get wiped out. You know? People have pointed out that this estimate didn't include the, the, the cost from conflict resulting from large-scale migration. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, people might move into a neighboring country. What is uh, the potential cost of uh, that conflict? Eh? No, there are these very complex effects which have not been included in this estimation, mainly because it's almost impossible to put a monetary value on these things. Eh? And then there is uh, the issue of uncertainty. You know, for some things, you know, calculating probabilities fairly easy. You know, I mean, the, the insurance industry basically can exist because it's uh, the rather easy to calculate the chance of you know someone with a particular you know, ethnic background and the, the lifestyle and occupation and so on dying in the next, uh, say, 10 years, 20 years or whatever. You know? They have a pretty accurate estimation of the chance of some 18-year-old guy who just bought the car kind of uh, having an accident. Yeah? But when it comes to things like uh, the climate change, there's a uh, huge uncertainty. I mean, that, some would describe this as uh, Keynesian uncertainty, because uh, this is an uncertainty that was uh, emphasized by Keynes. You just cannot estimate with any confidence, the range of plausible probabilities. And I think uh, the person who put this uh, idea most beautifully is uh, Donald Rumsfeld, the former defense secretary of the United States. I mean, of course, uh, he did it uh, uh, without realizing what he was doing. But you know, the, he once said that there are known knowns, and there are known unknowns, but then there are unknown unknowns. Yeah? That's Keynesian uncertainty. Yeah? So there are things that we know that they exist and we can reasonably yeah, estimate the probabilities for. Yeah? That's known known. Yeah? Known unknowns. Yeah? These are things that we know that is likely to happen. We can't quite uh, estimate the probability, but we at least know that they, that they are possible. Yeah? But with uh, things like climate change, uh, there are so many unknown unknowns. Yeah? You don't even know that the problem exists, not to speak of calculating the probability. Anyway, so that when you have uh, something like this, it is uh, the almost impossible to assign probabilities uh, to likely events. A, you don't really know what the likely events are. B, even if you know, it's almost impossible to put the probability on them. I mean, for these things, uh, the difficulty of uh, putting monetary value on is uh, the really secondary. Eh? By nature, things like climate change happen over a long period of time. You have to somehow find a way to decide whether, say, cost of $100 uh, today is bigger or smaller than benefit of $120 uh, 20 years later. Eh? Because, well, not unreasonably, a lot of people argue that $100 today is more valuable than $100 tomorrow. The main justification is that, uh, especially when it comes to things like climate change, uh, the world will be richer 20, 30, 50 years later because you know, we keep growing. You know? The output uh, keeps growing uh, faster than the population, however low the rate is. So our future selves and our grandchildren, they are going to be richer. So if we have to spend, I don't know, $100 million uh, to do something about uh, climate change, and if uh, they get uh, only $100 million benefit, your future self and your uh, grandchildren, then actually it's uh, not uh, worth it because the cost is higher. Eh? Because that uh, future $100 million is uh, not as valuable as uh, today's $100 million. Eh? So basically what you do is uh, you introduce uh, this uh, thing called discount rate, uh, which is 
like interest rate, but you know, uh, into the future, and say uh, my discount rate is at three percent, which means that hundred dollar next year for me is only worth uh, ninety-seven dollars today. Hmm? And then you keep that, uh, uh, using this rate to, well, essentially calculate that, that uh, something equivalent to compound interest rate uh, to know how much $100 will be worth in 20 years or 25 years or 200 years. Eh? Now, discounting, of course, is uh, the, once again a sensible thing to do. But... I mean, it doesn't quite work for something like climate change with a long time horizon. First of all, with something like climate change, you don't even know that the, the, the world economy will be richer than today in the future. Because some people are predicting that when there's climate change, the, the effect will be so devastating that actually the world economy might have trouble growing at the rate that we have been growing. So at some point, if the environmental the, the challenges become too large and the economy keeps uh, shrinking, actually it becomes uh, very difficult to justify discounting. But moreover, because uh, the, when you do this uh, discounting, you do it in a compounding way, As uh, the time horizon uh, gets longer, the effects uh, uh, get uh, magnified. Eh? And if uh, the future time horizon is uh, very long, the effect of compounding will be huge. Eh? So to illustrate this point, you know, the discount rate uh, for these uh, the environmental things are often uh, set at 5%. Eh? Now, if you use the 5% uh, discount rate and calculated the value of world GDP, which at the moment uh, stands around that 75.5 trillion, say 200 years later, because of this uh, compounding effect, it will be only equivalent to about $4.4 billion, which is 0.0058% of the original value, and equivalent to the GDP of Togo, the 155th largest economy of the 193 UN member countries. Yeah, so basically it's nothing. Problem with uh, climate change is that, uh, that what the costs uh, that we need to pay to prevent it are mainly concentrated in the next, uh, the, say, 20, 30 years. Eh? And the benefits that we see will come in at the earliest uh, 40, 50 years and possibly into 100, 200 years into the future. Eh? So this is why many environmentalists uh, argue that applying discounting to climate policy is a kind of discrimination against uh, future generations. Yeah? Simply because they're not here and they will be here in 200 years, they don't count. Yeah? This is a serious issue for something like uh, climate change. I mean, if you are, I don't know, calculating the value of uh, building a road in a the particular area, uh, yeah, probably it's a reasonable uh, practice to, to adopt because you know, the cost that, uh, and benefit will be basically within the next uh, 10, 20 years uh, the, together. Eh? But for something like climate change, uh, this is a big problem. What the uh, cost-benefit analysis does is actually not compatible with Pareto criterion, which is supposed to be at the foundation of neoclassical economics. Eh? So Pareto cri uh, criterion, just to remind you, says that you cannot call a social change an improvement if it makes even one person worse off. What the economists do when they do cost-benefit analysis, they aggregate all the costs and benefits without regard to the distribution of costs and benefits and somehow come up with a single value for the whole country, for community, even the whole world when it comes to climate change. Yeah? 
There's no recognition that this is uh, completely incompatible with uh, climate change. Eh? Because yes, uh, the net benefit might be you know, uh, positive, but uh, it might mean uh, making lots of people worse off. Eh? I mean, it's a uh, general problem with the uh, cost-benefit analysis, uh, not just to do with uh, environmental policy, but you have to recognize that. Yeah? So the distribution of consequences are completely ignored. And then there is the issue of the challenge of valuing human life. Uh, we already discussed yeah, how economists try to infer the value of uh, human life by looking at labor market and wage differentials. You know, for example, when it comes to climate change, uh, the World Health Organization has predicted that uh, a four-degree warming would probably cause an extra half a million premature deaths every year because there'll be more malaria. I mean, more people that will experience uh, heat waves or the die of dehydration and so on. Yeah? yeah, how do you value the life of these people? Yeah? Now, the thing is, uh, if you use uh, the uh, wage differentials approach that we described earlier, it will actually mean that you are going to value the life of people in poor countries much more lowly than you value the life of people in rich countries. Indeed, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has valued lives lost in the rich countries uh, due to climate change at uh, $1.5 million, but uh, the lives uh, the in poor countries only at about $100,000. Eh? It's basically because people in poor countries are a lot more willing to accept uh, high, higher risk jobs at a slight wage differential eh? because they are desperate. Eh? These people are also a lot less uh, willing to spend money on you know, avoiding the risk of uh, climate change because uh, they have uh, little money. Eh? So if you use that uh, wage differential approach, the wage differential for a given risk will be lower in a poor country than that for the same risk in a rich country. Eh? So uh, going back to that uh, fictitious example earlier, in the US, you might have to pay the guy $900 more to make him do this job, which has uh, the, you know, one out of 10,000 uh, risk of death over risk-free job. In a developing country, this could be just uh, the $20. Yeah? A lot of people get upset, you know, I mean, that this is uh, morally unacceptable, you know. How can you say that some guy living in a rich country is uh, 15 times uh, more worth uh, than a uh, guy uh, living in a poor country? Yeah? But whether we accept this uh, defense as convincing depends on whether we think that the market prices are morally acceptable. Yeah? Because uh, that the lower value of life in poor countries is a consequence of uh, using market prices. You know? So uh, you have uh, the, you know, wage differential in the, this country, which is much lower you know, compared to that in a rich country. So that gives you low value of life. Go back to that Dom Helder Kamara quote. When I give uh, food to poor people, they call me a saint. When I ask why they don't have uh, enough to eat, they call me a communist. You know? That really shows how the market prices are actually you know, a reflection of the underlying social order. Right? If you think that uh, you know, uh, poor people in poor countries are accepting this uh, high, higher risk uh, in their work only because uh, the, the say land is very unequally distributed, yeah? I mean, the, there's uh, the great uh, the barriers uh, to social mobility, now, there's an oligarchy that, that uh, prevents uh, people's access uh, that, to productive assets. Yeah, then you might say, well, actually, this uh, the wage differential, which is uh, much lower in a developing country, is wrong. Yeah? Because the underlying social order that produces that uh, 
wage differential is wrong. Yeah? And finally, the issue of uh, morality from the sort of, uh, Donald Trump uh, camp, uh, which basically denies that, uh, that it uh, is uh, caused by human activities, and therefore we can ignore it, or we can't really do anything about it, to you know, deep greens, uh, if you like, committed to drastic cuts in emissions uh, right now, right here, all of these people have moral considerations beyond GDP you know, in their thinking about uh, climate change because this is uh, not just about, you know, will we have more money that, that uh, 50 years later? Will your grandchildren that, that have uh, uh, less money than you do? It's about, you know, first of all, the different people's responsibilities for past emissions and cuts in future emissions. Yeah? yeah, because a lot of developing countries are very upset that, you know, that basically something like 70% of CO2 gas in the atmosphere was uh, generated by the rich countries. Yeah? And then now they say, you know, I mean, so what is done is done. Now you have to cut your future emission. Yeah? And then yeah, that uh, understandably, a lot of uh, develop, uh, developing countries are upset about it because uh, it sounds like the rich countries washing their hands off uh, that, uh, from their historical responsibilities. Eh? You know, people who are against uh, actions uh, for climate change tend to argue that you know, government intervention to transform the economy onto a low carbon path basically poses a great threat to economic freedom. Yeah? The government doesn't have the right to tell us uh, how to consume, how to produce. Yeah? I mean, many uh, environmentalists are not you know, doing cost-benefit analysis and say, well, we should do this uh, because you know, the X years later, we'll be better off uh, if we did this. Yeah? They are more thinking in terms of our obligation to the future generation, you know, our obligation to the planet, and you know, how do you, you know, monetize this thing? Yeah? If GDP was all that mattered, you could say the Second World War had uh, the really no effect on the world. Yeah? No, actually, the, by some estimates, the Second World War increased world GDP. Yeah? So was it a good thing? Well, no one will say that because there was the Holocaust, you know, there was the atomic bomb in Japan. And, yeah, I mean, the human suffering on a kind of cosmic scale that throughout the world. You know? So, you know, this poses a fundamental moral dilemma. You know? There are so many ethical issues involved in especially things like uh, climate change. And we just uh, don't know how to deal with this. You know? I have discussed various uh, technical, theoretical, and moral problems with cost-benefit analysis. This uh, approach needs to be used in conjunction with other approaches because it has some serious uh, deficiencies. First of all, we need to use uh, things like structured interviews or group discussion forums in order to gain more nuanced understanding of what people want. Yeah? Because I have already told you that, that when they do cost-benefit analysis, I mean, the economists sometimes resort uh, to surveys, yeah? because there's no other way to find out how much people value this, how much uh, they are willing to pay for, I don't know, flood defense or whatever. So what we need is uh, to kind of uh, really that, uh, give uh, people opportunity to express their moral and political judgments through these uh, the discussion forums and uh, more the in-depth uh, structured interviews because uh, that trying to force them to put monetary value on everything is really distorting the picture. Yeah? Okay, this way you may not get one nice neat number, yeah? but that's the nature of the world. This mess is complex. Yeah? Secondly, we need to take this issue of uncertainty very seriously when it comes to climate change, especially. And people have advocated this thing uh, called the precautionary principle. This was uh, first uh, 
uh, kind of uh, flagged uh, in a major way in the 1992 Rio Declaration on Environment and Development of the United Nations. The first idea is that we have to acknowledge the limits uh, to our knowledge and accept that sometimes we just don't have enough information to come up with a reasonable probability estimation. I mean, unfortunately, what happens is that uh, when economies are supposed to do cost-benefit analysis for some government ministry or agency, you know, they are forced uh, to invent these probabilities. Yeah? I mean, they have no real scientific basis uh, to come up with uh, certain numbers, but since everything has to be put in monetary terms and they need to produce a single number in the end, they have to invent this. Yeah? The second idea is that some threats are fundamentally more serious and should be treated differently. You know? So things like climate change, you know? it's a problem in a class of its own. You know? It's not like, I don't know, I mean, building a bypass you know, near, I don't know, the, uh, some market town in the Cambridge. You know? This is a the problem of uh, its uh, unique uh, that, uh, class and you know, these uh, problems uh, need to be taken seriously and uh, precautionary actions might have to be taken in relation to it, even if you don't have the full picture. Yeah? Having seen how the cost-benefit analysis favored by the mainstream of the economics uh, profession decides on environmental goals and what the limitations of the approach are, we still need to discuss uh, what kind of policy tools, uh, what kind of means uh, are recommended to deal with uh, climate uh, problems and other environmental issues. And that will be the topic of the second part of this lecture, which will come later in the series.